thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And, and welcome to the next session in our Admin and Data Forum. Uh, is your scheme digital ready? Well, uh, forthcoming research from LexisNexis Risk Solutions and Professional Pensions uh, will reveal that 77% of UK adults want access to occupational pensions via a digital platform. Uh, yet it will show that very, uh, far fewer schemes offer this sort of functionality. Uh, we've got uh, uh, quite a bit of research to go through and we've got a great discussion ahead. Uh, with me to discuss these issues, Alan Clay, uh, Head of Strategy for Customer Data Solutions at LexisNexis Risk Solutions, and Christy Cotton. Uh, she's an Actuary and Associate Director at Deloitte. Um, before we start, Alan, Christy, can I uh, ask each of you to sort of tell us a little bit more about yourself and what it is you do? Um, Alan, can I go for you first? Good morning, folks. Um, yeah, so Alan Clay, I've been in the data industry longer than I care to remember, and I'll share a thought with you. I actually find data really interesting. I might even use the word sexy data later on when we're talking about the future. So please don't share that externally. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, data, um, and what I've been doing with it over that time period is ranged from running marketing campaigns in my early career through to looking at credit referencing data in my time with Experian. And now we're using a plethora of reference data to try and overcome this challenge of data maintenance. So people move house, they change name. And rather than having, if you think about signing up to the dashboards, um, rather than saying, where have you lived and having to put in six addresses, there are ways and means of getting you to put in one address and then back tracing it to all the addresses you've lived in. So there's all sorts of things that we can begin to explore to make that sort of consumer experience, that person experience, a whole lot better. Thank you. Christy. Yes, hello, Christy Cotton. Um, so yes, actuary, um, don't shoot the actuary. Um, and as social director at Deloitte, I'm also a chair of the PASA data working group. So that's the kind of main reason why I'm here today. Uh, my background is um, I've kind of been in the industry 12, 13 years now and work with a lot of clients around data. But again, uh, passion for data, absolutely. I've seen it where data goes wrong many, many times. I've seen the kind of consequences of data going wrong and helped a lot of clients to and um, kind of backtrack and get back to the position they need to be in. Um, and I've worked with lots of colleagues across the industry now around trying to come together with guidance around we can help um, lots of people, you know, get data right, get it right in the first place and maintain it as well. So all of the work around stuff that we're doing with PASA is really interesting. It's great to see that there's a uh, real interest in trying to improve the way that data is um, sorted out and then maintained so that we can get those better outcomes for members. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, if I could start off, uh, uh, one finding from the research shows that trustees have a very high level of confidence in the completeness and accuracy of their data, rated it on average at 8.3 out of 10. Conversely, the member research we did as part of this shows that uh, over half of members say they don't always tell their scheme about changes of details. Um, Alan, I'll start with you, if I may. To what extent do you think there's a bit of sort of, dare I say, overconfidence in data among schemes and trustees? I think I need to be careful of what I say, bearing in mind who's in the room. Um, but, but there's perhaps a view that says, of course, my data is accurate because I captured it correctly. Um, but then you need to look at it at a slightly different lens. You might have captured it 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago. What's happened in that time? How has it changed? Has it changed? Um, and that's a reflection on whether people move house, whether they get married, they get divorced. So there are a number of reasons why there might be some changes. Um, and there's another piece in data that says, I've asked somebody for their national insurance number, and this was mentioned earlier, that has it been accurately captured? Um, indeed, is there only one national insurance number for a person? So for example, I had the challenge a few years ago with my pension provider, they gave me a slightly different national insurance number. So when I got my annual statement, I thought, hold on, I've been paying in a bit more than that. Um, and so they had to unravel that. And that leads to a whole range of other challenges in terms of trying to prove first and foremost, which one's accurate and re-entering re, um, the right information, but then repatriating the information. Okay, so perhaps there's that 
view from the trustees and so on that they've captured it correctly, so why wouldn't it be accurate? The other piece, and I think this is the biggest challenge for everybody involved in data, is there's a concept called unknown unknowns. Okay, so these things shouldn't happen, but they do happen. And when they do happen, again, it's trying to unravel them and going back to source data systems to try and find the right information and then populate it within the, um, the, the, the main system, as it were. Christy, would you agree? Uh, yeah, sort of absolutely. I think there is this um, view on you capture data and then it's, it's accurate. And actually, we've, you know, we've heard from so many people today that that's not the way that data works in the pension space. Um, data is constantly evolving. And I think it's also really important to understand when did you ask that question of trustees? If you ask them um, at a point in time when they've just done a data audit, they've probably got quite good confidence. If you ask them when something's just gone wrong, they've just had a major member complaint and something's triggered through and it's made them ask a few questions, you're probably gonna get quite a different view. And that, those two data sets are similar. Um, and the same same scheme, but the point you ask them depends on the confidence they've got. I think for a lot of people with data, you know, pension schemes, there is so much data to be held here. There is the data that you see all the time, the benefits, the member's name. There's so much historical data that's needed, particularly as you start to work through exercises that schemes are facing, GMP equalisation. The volume of data there is really large. And I think until you start to dive into it, that's the only point that you really have a view on how good that data is. So I think there probably is a bit of an overconfidence. If you haven't looked at your data in, in a while, that data's fine. But when it goes wrong, you think, oh, actually, is that data good enough? And I think also from a member point of view, you know, we all know, oh, I'm, I'm, I've done this before, I've moved house and not told uh, my pension scheme that I moved house. And so if somebody asks me that question, I go, oh, I haven't told them. But actually in the background, pension schemes have got processes where they're probably tracing me and I don't know. They might have found me, sent me a letter, and I've seen it come through the post and gone on and not even registered that letter's come through. So again, there is this a point in time you ask that question. So I think from we can you know all see there probably is a mismatch in the information and the view. And again, potentially that overconfidence in uh, what's happening where you've delegated duties, but there's probably somewhere in the middle that is the true view. Yeah, well, we've got the uh, dashboard project coming uh, sort of full steam down the line. Um, bringing about, I think it's fair to say, Alan, a, a mass digitization of the industry. H how well do you think we are prepared for that? I'm giving you the difficult ones. Yeah, so in terms of that preparation, um, you know, have people done that initial audit to understand what their challenges are in terms of the data that they're holding. So first and foremost, the inform information about their members. But we were having a discussion last week, and are they members or are they actually people? If you call them members, it seems that they're somehow this other being. But it's people's lives that we're affecting if we're not holding data accurately. And indeed, it's a, a sort of vulnerable time in their life that you stop working, so they're relying on pensions, etc. So there's some elements um, there to say that's what we've got to focus on. But the first step, as you know, we've heard already this morning, is about the audit. How good is your data across all of the different ways and the different lenses that you view your data through? Um, a common measure that we get involved in is when people speak to us and say, we've got this returned mail problem. We've got all this information back when we've done our annual statements. Um, but you could argue that you can put in preventative measures to make sure that rather than sending a mailing out um, with all the benefit statements, if you check whether the person's there first and foremost, you can save just getting the returned mail and the other piece that we've seen, partly in the research and elsewhere, is that returned mail is only a subset of the real problem. Because if you send a letter to where somebody used to live, the new occupants might say, it's not addressed to me, and bin it. They don't put it back in the post. So, you know, perhaps the um, amount of data challenges that you've got, going back to the earlier point, is actually greater <coughs> than you think it is. But again, it's another um, view that was mentioned earlier is please start, do something now. Um, uh, I was going to say, I was going to make a reference to Live Aid when Bob Geldof and the people in the room might say, give us the money now, just do something, don't sit there and walk into oblivion.
It won't be that bad, by the way. I, I, I exaggerate. <laughs> but uh, there seems to be a complacency. Do something now? Is yeah, that the, uh... absolutely. That is the message. I mean, we bang that drum a lot um, I, at PASA and in kind of my more consultancy role as well. Please act on, on data now. I think that the answer to the question is there's probably a massive range. I think for some schemes, particularly if they have seen something go wrong before and they've been triggered, I know we heard from uh, Hyman's Robertson earlier around the reasons when you would do uh, data audits. If you've been triggered to do it, you're probably ahead of the curve, something's gone wrong, you've had to undertake an exercise, you're planning on looking at the end game. Um, but the schemes where they haven't been triggered to do it, actually, when was the last time they did a data audit? You know, what And what is it that's pushing them towards doing that? Is it trying to get towards um, a better DAU process? Um, even that itself should be a trigger. Or is it that you actually need to think, you know, we've heard, we've seen the timeframes come through, pensions dashboard is coming. And we've also heard about the process that you need to go through to do a data, proper data review. It doesn't take a month. You can't say there, oh, please sort my data out. A month later, what's the update? You know, that, that's not how these things work. They take a long time to actually go through planning them, doing them properly. Actually, the review itself takes a long time. Then you've got to access the data itself. And then you've got to update records. All of these things take a long time. So I think it's really important to act now. But I think, again, coming back to the question of, are we ready? It depends what we're trying to get ready for. Um, looking at the digital space, there's so many different angles of that. If you're just trying to get yourself ready to meet dashboard, that's one angle. If you're trying to get, get yourself ready to have go onto an app that people can view, that's another angle. But actually from a pensions industry, if we look at um, our phones now, what can we do on our phones? We can go onto our uh, banking apps and we can see our accounts, our savings, our mortgages, our, ins our insurance products. We can see all of those and we can quickly say, oh, well, I, I, that doesn't work. That's not what I need anymore. That's not the right level of insurance that I need for that. We can make changes. Can we do that in a pension space? Some may say yes. A lot will say no. So if you're trying to get towards real uh, digitalization in the pensions industry, there's a long way to go. Thank you very much indeed, Christy. Um, so this is an interactive session, so I'm going to come now to you um, and ask you, we've been talking a lot about auditing uh, data. Can I have a quick show of hands as to who has audited their scheme data, say, within the last few years? So that's sort of probably around a quarter, would you say? A quarter, a third? Um, thank you very much indeed, thank you. Um, uh, Alan, does that sort of surprise you firstly and secondly, can you just sort of talk us through a little bit about what a, why you think a data audit is important firstly and secondly, uh, you know, how you'd go about the process, what would it involve? Yeah, so in terms of does it surprise me, uh, no, it's about in line with the um, uh, research, um, so, so that's the first bit. Um, and from our sort of supplier perspective, we say audits are straightforward. Give us all of your data. We'll tell you everything about the sort of the areas that need improvement. We'll work with you. We'll give you a plan. But that rather neglects the challenge that you'll have internally, first and foremost, of getting all of those bits of data together. Um, so, you know, data is often held in silos as different organizations have merged and so on. So. There's a challenge first and foremost in that element. And then there's the other challenge is providing data to a third party, such as ourselves. You've got the obvious compliance hurdle. Hold on, we're giving all of our sensitive pension data to a third party. What do they look like? What's their sort of their history? Um, do we trust them and so on and so forth? Um, so having got those two bits over of sort of getting the data out of the organization and provided to us. The key piece, I think, is having done the audit is so what next? Okay, so you can, you can if you're doing an audit to tick a box to say we've done the audit, then that's really, really, really easy. Um, however, if you've got that incorrect member data back, you've got to then start communicating with those people. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, again, you know, if, if, if you know people have moved, um, some of the organisations we work with, their compliance team say you must send a letter to the old, old address and the new address. When it's confirmed back that they're at the new address, then you can update the member record and so on. But then there are other challenges in terms of what if you can't find them at the new address? Well, increasingly we're providing contact phone numbers 
um, and email addresses that have been compliantly captured to say, if we can't find you through contact through the post, then try other means of communications. Um, there's a, there will be a cohort in that data audit that even when you've gone through the process of trying to reconnect with them, you won't be able to find them. And if they've got a large pension pot, you know, it's the right thing to do to try even harder to find them. And that's where things like forensic tracing services come into play. Um, because if you can't find them in an electronic means, in batch at scale, you can't just leave them. So, um, you know, you've got to try and repatriate the assets. So there's a whole range of things to do that you can use social media and then phone co uh, follow up and so on to make sure you're doing everything you possibly can that you feel is right to reconnect with that person. So I guess the audit, the numbers is one thing, but then it's the process of all of the downstream bits to say, what are we going to do and when are we going to do it? Because the external piece, we take care of it. There's, you know, it's a waiting game on, on, on your side, as it were. But then who's going to make the changes to the host systems? Who's going to run the campaigns to contact people? And then what about any queries that you get from the people, the pension uh, members calling in to say, we've just got this letter. What does it mean? And all the rest. So it's a... Um, you know, it's, it needs to be fully planned all the way through the life cycle of that audit. Um, and having done it once, it's not a, again, Christy mentioned it just now, don't just forget it and say, yeah, in June 2022, I had a nice clean data set because July 2022, it started degrading again. So it's an ongoing program. And again, we've put in place triggers to say, our reference data says that Alan Clay's moved from address one to address two, and that can be played out to um, pension schemes so that you're doing a, an as and when update to any of that base data, because the longer you leave data incorrect, the harder it is to trace. Christy, um, thank you, Alan. Uh, Christy, just, just to move on from that, obviously there are lots of uh, uh, great firms such as uh, LexisNexis Risk Solutions that can audit your data and, and, and do lots of work uh, uh, out there. But um, are there other ways schemes can get this confidence in the data? Is there a sort of anything else they can be doing or, or does it all come down to ultimately whether you do it through uh, uh, Alan's firm or, 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 or internally or some other way, does it all come down to doing an audit of that data? Yeah, I think there's, there's kind of two aspects to managing your data. Um, the one is the ongoing approach. And I think, you know, it's so important to have those controls, processes in place, which need, you know, um, a methodology of monitoring your data. You can do those in, internally through, you know, ongoing checks, ongoing reviews around gaps, you know, where things are doing and making sure that you have that return mail. If you have someone call you up, you have a process in place whereby you follow it through. Um, but you do have to maintain it. And I think just from an ease point of view, you look at hurdles to data. From a trustee point of view, you want to know that you can do this properly. Um, and I think sometimes it is just a lot simpler and more effective to use the resources that are out there. And a lot of those are accessed um, most easily through third parties, either through your own administrator. And a lot of these will have ongoing relationships with these third parties that provide you access to these massive data sources or you know doing it separately through your own contracts with these with these things it's not it's not about spending money and it's not about firms trying to um, make pension schemes spend money it's about making it spending that money now getting in place processes that yes of course have a cost um, but actually do make it a lot better for you in, in the end and actually mean that your administration costs your ongoing costs come down um, but the first point is, you, all of these things only work as long as they work together. So maintaining data, you have to start with good data. Good data only stays good if it's maintained. So you've got to do both of them. So um, the, the, what is there, I think we said there about a quarter of people here have done a data audit. Well, what's the barrier to stopping that? And I think a lot of it comes down to cost. Um, you know, we all know that these things cost a lot of money. So you do that cost risk analysis, don't you, around, you know, what's, what, what am I trying to achieve here? Is this worth, is it my administrator wanting to make me spend more money? Or is it actually there a real reason why I want to do this? And 
Um, I think, you know, again, we get triggered because we know that something's gone wrong and we have to, but there is so much benefit to doing that analysis now, getting it right, getting you to have a really good starting point with your data, knowing that at this point in time, that's as good as it's going to get. And it's, you know, you've got process to, to deal with the little few bits that are still there and then having this maintenance program. And there are lots of ways of doing that, but you just have to go through that process and do it effectively. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, does anybody have any questions for our panel at this point in time? Uh, any questions or indeed comments? Yes, sir. Thank you very much indeed. A uh, uh, microphone is just on its uh, way. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, throughout the morning, when we've been talking about incorrect data, uh, the example typically quoted is wrong address. And um, Interesting that Alan there a bit earlier was picking up on a point I'm going to make that if you haven't got the address, then it's important to get this, the second and third thing is telephone number and, and an email address. Can I be a bit controversial and say, well, in this data age, why do we want an address? We want to contact the member. If we're going digital, then surely the prime uh, record we should have is a member's email address and telephone number. Or, or at least his email address, because if we're wanting him, he's going to expect to access our system through the internet, then we should have that internet contact with him. And that's yeah. far more important than having his address. I can only agree. <laughs> um, the reason, the reason that, it's, that the address is still important today is that, well, first of all, if you ring up with a member query, they'll say, what's your name? what's your address or even your national insurance number, but people don't always know the national insurance number. So the address is still used as a method of authentication, okay? Um, the other challenge with email addresses, if you said, what's, what's your name and what's your email address? I can set up email addresses, I can set up 10 in the next 10 minutes. And so that's opens yourself up to a bit of fraud. Um, but you know, you're absolutely right that we should be using new methods of um, or making sure that that's the primary contact that we have with somebody, not using this old-fashioned thing called the address. Um, there's all sorts of things that we're doing in our digital intelligence and digital fraud areas where by looking at how somebody's using their phone, we can say whether it's a fraudulent transaction or it's me using my phone because of the way you use a keypad. It's all really clever, I don't understand it. Um, but um, yeah, you could, the angle you hold the phone, the speed of typing and so on, that can pick up whether it's me, my kids, or somebody else who's picked up my phone trying to hack me. Um, so there's a whole range of things that we need to do. But if we were to say, if we were to bounce it back to you and say, right, for all of you here today, I know we've been talking about names, addresses, dates of birth, national insurance numbers, can you now flip that to having email address or phone number as your primary point of identification? That would cause a whole range of other work. And I'm sure in time the industry will get there, but it's just not there today. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, hi, just following up on that, Alan. Um, I completely agree we want email addresses and phone numbers, but are there a group, a cohort, you've kind of mentioned fraud, where these members are particularly vulnerable, where if we were to contact them using email or phone, there yeah. is an inherent yeah. risk. And when you provide that type of data, do you provide the follow-on data around the risk associated with that to the clients? And then a follow-on question <laughs> from that, if you do provide details on vulnerability, are you seeing situations where actually email address is the right way forward to contact people who are vulnerable. I'm thinking perhaps members in Ukraine or whatever. Yeah. And is that also data you're providing your clients? So, um, yeah, the, first of all, on the email address, part of that digital transaction data we hold is we're monitoring any email address that's ever been seen on the dark web or has been used in fraudulent transactions and it gets a flag. So rather than just saying, here's a whole bunch of email addresses, go and contact them, we can screen them against a risk score associated with the e email address. Um, so, and it is known because you can triangulate the email addresses back to people. We found instances where one person is using 300 different email addresses and they're heavily involved in fraudulent transactions that way. So there are ways and means, but remember, it's data, it's not proof, foolproof, it's not 100% coverage, but we can do everything we can to mitigate the circumstances. 
um, you brought up a really interesting point, which is if you got an email address from your pension provider, uh, sorry, if you got an, e an outbound email saying, hey, we're your pension provider, come and do this with us, because of the high profile scams that there have been, you'd be thinking, whoa, is this, is this right? So again, um, what some of the people in the banking industry have done is to say, we're about to start using your email address as a primary form of communication. Are you okay with that? And before clicking on any sensitive information, you can get a one-time passcode, for example. So let's learn from what the others are doing. We're not approaching data problems ourselves independently of anybody else. There's lots of wider experience in other market sectors. So let's use that. Um, and I think that'll accelerate our learnings in, in you know, everything we do in this, this area. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think that's, that's what I was going to say. I think, you know, the pensions industry, we've got other industries we can look to and to, to, to take what they're doing from, if you think from your banking, you know, all of us will um, have access to something where we get a verification code either to our telephone number or to our email address. We, we need to be able to take the learnings from those industries and bring the pensions industry in line with those. And there absolutely will be challenges. Address will never be a data item that isn't needed. It should always be there, it should always be validated, but yet let's use the others um, data that's available to us to make it a better journey for our members. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, coming back to the survey and, and taking a slightly different angle, uh, uh, the survey showed that uh, many members don't have access to any digital portal from their pension scheme. Uh, and, and even fewer have access to a sort of smartphone app or, or, or access to the pensions that way. Um, why is this, Alan, and what are the advantages of a digital portal? There's another piece to that question. Um, or, so I've got access to my pension provider's digital portal. It tells me how much I've got in my pension. So, you know, great that they've got there, but, but then, you know, having that information, you actually want to connect it to real behaviours um, and, and ways of changing it. So the first statement, if, you were, if I was designing a, a pension app, I'd say, right, here's what you've got. This is what it means in terms of an annual payment. Um, if you want to increase your uh, pension pot, these are the things that you can do. Now, there's a future time where we get all connected um, and some of the big, you know, if you think Lloyds Bank, they've got Scottish widows, they've got mortgages, credit cards, all the rest. They could join all of that together. So when I log on to my app, it says, right, your mortgage amount is this, it's nearly paid off. Your pension pot is this, you've got savings. So let's bring that in. So run it just being a pensions view in your pensions app. I think that's too short sighted. And it'd be much better to have this more expansive view to say, you've got this amount in your pension, this amount in other savings, which means you've got a much wider pot of money, basically, to plan your retirement. Um, so, you know, there's some brief views, but let me have a, a Christy yeah, to come I, in at I this think, point. I think the, the biggest thing here is around the ex expectations of the industry. I think we all expect that we should be able to access our banking information in a certain way. Um, whereas um, members just, you know, they're kind of used to not being able to um, have this information and certain parts of it, uh, absolutely, when the, some of the DC schemes are, that's, it's moving on, but some of the legacy DB schemes, it's never been there. It's, there's no talk about it going to be there. So the expectation isn't, members aren't shouting at trustees to get it. So trustees think, why spend that money? Why make a change? But I think, you know, we need to be very aware that those expectations are going to change. Dashboard is going to make those expectations change. The more um, you see information, the more you think, actually, that's not enough information. Now I want more. And I think the industry needs to be really ready that as soon as Dashboard does start to come in, the expectations of your membership is going to change around how much they, uh, how easy they can access it and how much data is available when they do. Well, thank you both very much indeed. I'm afraid we're running out of time for this session, but uh, be before we end, um, can I ask each of you sort of your key mm -hmm. takeaways or sort of including thoughts? Um, Alan, I'll go for you first. Again, yeah, so okay. I've mentioned it already. Please don't do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you do one thing today, you know, lots of people have been up here on the stage saying, just start. And, you know, whether you're running a marathon or doing data work, it, the first step is the hardest step. So, you know, part of the process is to get the right people together internally, say, we're going to start now. 
Um, and please do that. That would be my concluding thought. Thank you, Christy. Yeah, and for me, I absolutely agree. And to build on that, I think you need to think, you know, why are you doing this? Please don't do a data review just to get GMP equalization done. Please don't do it just because you've got an issue with a certain category of members. Think, I'm trying to achieve better data. I'm trying to work towards automation. I'm trying to get this scheme running effectively. Look at your data across the whole piece, get a good plan strategy in place, and then maintain it going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. And thank you uh, to both Alan and Christy for such a great uh, uh, panel session. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.